Good morning, everyone. You might not recognize me up here. My name is Jill Ann Nonenberg, and I am our new director of youth ministries. Pastor Kirk is out this morning with laryngitis. Uh, he has lost his voice, but otherwise he is feeling okay. And so Pastor Annalise is going to be delivering our message this morning, and I am filling in as liturgist. Uh, since this is my first time doing this at Braddock Street, I thank you in advance for your grace when I inevitably mess everything up and the service is ruined. <laughs> Here at Braddock Street, our mission and our vision as a community is that we love God through worship, we love one another through small groups, and we love our neighbors and the world through service. And so if that sounds like a mission that you want to be a part of, then you are in the right place this morning. Just a few things to let you know as we begin worship. If you do have a prayer request that you would like our community to pray over in the coming week, you can either send that to info at Braddock Street, uh, info at braddockstreetumc.org, or for those folks who are joining us online, everyone say, hello, people online. Uh, you are also welcome to drop them in the chat or on the Facebook page. If you are new here, and I'm, it's possible that no one here is new, but you're new to me probably, so I will just say this in case. Uh, there is a green card in your pew uh, that you can fill out with just a little bit of information about you uh, so that we can get to know you. Pastor Annalise and myself will also be in the gathering space after worship, and we'd love for you to say hello. And once again, our online folks, uh, if you, this is your first time joining us, please just drop your name in the chat uh, so that everyone can welcome you. And uh, let's see, maybe, oh yes, very important. Our Healthy Church team uh, met this past week given the surging cases of COVID in our community. And I am glad to say that we have decided that it is okay to continue in person as well as online worship. However, to ensure that we are loving our neighbors uh, through keeping each other safe, masks are going to be required at all times indoors, uh, regardless of your vaccination status. And we do ask that as you are able, if you can try and keep that CDC recommended uh, three feet of distance around you uh, as best you can. <laughs> I, I saw that over there. Uh, no, no pushing away your loved ones. This is not an excuse. <laughs> Uh, Pastor Annalise, myself, our leaders, uh, will take off our masks at certain times throughout the worship when we're far enough away from everybody so people who need to can read our lips. Uh, but other than that, we will also uh, be observing our mask rule. Now, really quickly, I know that you've all been standing already for a little bit. I'm going to go off script for about 20 seconds because, you know, with everything going on, like pandemic and supply chain craziness, and maybe there's going to be a snowpocalypse this afternoon, and whatever else you are bringing with you to worship this morning, know that God has space for that. And I invite everybody, it's a little awkward with our masks, but let's just all take a deep breath together. In and out. You are here, and God is here with us, no matter what we are bringing. And so in that spirit of gratitude and worship, I invite you to remain standing as our music team leads us in our first song.
Please be seated, and we invite the children forward for the scripture and the children's message. So let the children come. Chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard of this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Judas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may be even found fighting against God. They were convinced by him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hey, friends. Um, So I'm probably a person you don't know. I'm probably a stranger. So I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jillian, and it's really good to be with you today. I'm friends with Pastor Annalise and Pastor Kirk. And when you guys get to be old enough that you're in like middle school or high school, um, then you'll get to come be with me in our Blast Youth Group. And I really look forward to getting to know you. But today, I wanted to let you guys know about kind of an adventure that our church is starting today, where we are going to be exploring what people who are part of other religions, how they worship, how, what they believe, and how we can be good neighbors and friends to them. So people who go to church were Christians. Oh, I see Elmo over there. I hope, I hope uh, Rocco is not around because I fear there's been a feud with that uh, on the social medias. Uh, but, uh, sorry, squirrel. Uh, <laughs> but, Uh, But there are also people here in Winchester and all over the world who they believe different things about God and they serve people in different ways. But that doesn't mean that we can't be friends with them and love them, right? So I've got this cool basket. I'm calling it the basket of awesomeness. And most of it is stuff from Pastor Annalise. And there's all kinds of cool stuff in here that might look a little bit strange or unfamiliar to us, and we're going to be exploring the things in this basket over the next few weeks. But for today, I just want to show you one of them, and this is actually from my office here at the church, and it's upside down, so i got to flip it around here. And hopefully our friends online can see this a little bit as well. But this, this is a banner that has all kinds of different symbols, pictures that we use to know about other religions in our world. So you might see right here, there's a cross for us Christians, right? And over here, this is called a Star of David, and that is about for our Jewish brothers and sisters. But the writing on here is 
that even though all these religions believe different things and worship in different ways, we still have some things in common, right? Maybe you have friends at school who aren't exactly the same as you, but you still have things you both like to do together, right? And we call this thing that almost all religions in the world believe, we call it the golden rule, to say that maybe it's like gold because maybe it's the most important, right? And the way that Jesus said it was that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's on here, that's on this banner. But also on this banner is ways that the golden rule is said in other religions. So, for example, uh, let's see, I want to make sure that we're doing what, here we go. So some people are what are called Buddhists, and their way of saying the golden rule is make your own self the measure of others, and so abstain from causing hurt to them. And all of these religions that are, have all these different symbols for them, they all say that basically the most important rule is love other people the way you would want them to love you. And we're going to be talking in this adventure sermon series about a, lot of different, about a lot of the differences between us, but I think it's also important to remember that we have a lot in common, too. So for our prayer today, could, could we do something maybe a little bit different? And you, you guys up here in the front and the grown-ups in the seats and everybody online, could, we, could you maybe repeat after me for our prayer? Would you be okay doing that? All right. So repeat after me, big people and smaller people. Dear God, help us to love others for the ways that we are the same and the ways we are different. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming up here and talking with me. You guys can go back to your seats if you want. As many of you know, it is important to us here at Braddock Street that you know where the money that you give, whether it is in the plate on Sunday morning, online, uh, through your pledge, we want you to know the good that that money does. And so one of the ministries that we support that we are lifting up this morning is the Valley Assistance Network. Over 70, per, sorry, almost 70% of the families uh, who work with Van are those who are working full time, they are employed, and yet, and this is a story we've all become more and more familiar with, unfortunately, during the pandemic, they're just one crisis away from being in a very dangerous situation financially. And so Van is a place they can go to be referred to resources that are already out there to support them, as well as to receive financial literacy and emergency assistance. And as I said, the need for this has only exploded in the past two years. And so I want to thank you uh, for the generosity of your giving and all of the ministries uh, that Braddock Street supports that are helping to transform our community. Uh, and with that, I would invite the ushers to come forward so that we can continue to worship through our giving.
Good morning. My name is Annalise Stevens Jennings, and I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. And today we are beginning a sermon series about world religions and how Christians can relate to their adherents. It is based on a book by Reverend Adam Hamilton, um, and the book is of the same name as our series, which is Christianity and World Religions. And before I begin, I want to offer you all a quote from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s World House essay, and it goes like this. Some years ago, a famous novelist died. Among his papers was found a list of suggested plots for future stories, most prominently underscored being this one. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. This is the great new problem of mankind, we have inherited a large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who, because we can never live again apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This image here behind me is a beautiful one. It conjures up visions of peace. You see it and your mind goes to these pictures of like children of all races and ethnicities and abilities and classes, like holding hands in a circle and giving us all hope for a better future. I understand the goal of saying things like, all faiths are just different paths up one mountain. We're meant to hear that and think about unity and a world full of religious tolerance. All due respect to whoever the first person was to come up with this idea, but I think it's wrong. Because what's at the top of that one mountain? Christians would say it's the kingdom of God. Hindus would say it's moksha, release from the cycle. Buddhists, well, some of them, would say that it's full release from suffering. Muslims and Jews and Sikhs and Taoists and pagans and humanists would all have their own answers too. And who's correct? What happens? If, as Christians, we get to the top of this mountain and it's not the kingdom of God that we find waiting there, but the total non-existence that is hoped for by some Buddhists? What happens if any of us 
get to the top of this mountain and we don't find what we spent our lives striving for. This image doesn't really create unity. It delays more discord by trying to force uniformity where none is needed. And the world deserves better than tolerance and uniformity. We deserve love and individuality and true community. Our scripture for today tells us a story that we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about in church. It's not one of the big famous ones, right? It's not Moses and the Red Sea or Noah and the Ark or Jonah and a big fish. This is about resident troublemaker Peter. Say hi to Peter. And some of the other disciples are with him. Jesus has already returned to heaven and the earliest Christian church has been formed. They're sharing everything that they have in common and working together to share the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And preaching has gotten them into trouble, which any other pastors in the room understands what that feels like. Now, when our story picks up, we uh, we just missed the part where they were miraculously let out of prison. They had been put into prison because they were doing all of this preaching about Jesus, at the temple. So what do they do as soon as they get broken out of prison by a literal angel? They go right back to the temple and keep preaching about Jesus. So the guards have to bring them back in in front of the council again, and the council looks at these guys and says, "Uh, we specifically requested the opposite of this, and since they have broken the rules again, when, uh, when they are asked about it, the, these disciples, Peter and the gang, they literally say something along the lines of, yeah, we don't answer to you. And also, we are 100% going to keep doing this. So the council, therefore, wants to put them to death. And then one man, Gamaliel, say hello to Gamaliel, he speaks up. We might consider him to be a voice for religious tolerance. Gamaliel is a highly respected man. You could literally get on your phone right now and Google his name and you will find very quickly how important this man was to the Jewish community at the time that he lived. He basically says, look guys, the last two messiahs that showed up ended up not even being real and the people figured that out very quickly. If this guy is fake, then folks will stop listening to him. And if he's real, then do you want to be the ones with the blood of his followers on your hands? No, you don't. Just let them go. And they do. Thank God for Gamaliel and his willingness to err on the side of mercy. As we approach learning about other faiths and how we can relate to their followers, I hope that we can not only lean towards this kind of tolerance and mercy, but go all the way past that through fear and into love. I want to get a few things straight with us, though, before we go on the rest of this journey. And hold on, because my pages just went crazy. Back up. Okay. There we go. I want to get a few things straight before we take the rest of this journey over the next few weeks. Um, This is Adam. Say hi to Adam. Adam Hamilton, specifically. He's the guy that wrote our book. And the first chapter of his book is titled, Questions That People Ask. As a quick side note, if you have the original, like the first edition of this book, it is good to know that there is a revised edition, and the revised edition is legitimately better. Um, And so if you've got copies um, from the church that are uh, the, the first edition ones, I'm so sorry about that. Do your best, and if you can, get a revised edition because it's worth it. So, anyway, one of these questions that he starts off this first section with is, why should I be studying this at all? Now, my answer to that question is similar to Adam's in this case, and it is because not only will it help you to sharpen your own faith, but also because there are 7.8 billion people on the planet, and Christians are only 2.4 billion of them. So you can see this chart behind me here. We're a pretty big chunk but we're not the only chunk on here, right? And it's a good idea for us to know more about the other faiths that are represented there as well. Another question that Adam poses, why are there so many other religions in the world? Now, Adam answers this question differently than I do, and I'll let him do his own preaching. 
So I'm gonna tell you my answer. So why are there so many different religions? Because humanity has so many different worldviews. Dr. Stephen Prothero, that's him, say hello, talks about religions in terms of problems and solutions. For example, the biggest problem facing humanity as identified by Christians is that sin has separated us from God and from one another. And that the solution to that problem is a relationship with Jesus Christ, who has created for us, through his life, death, and resurrection, a bridge back to one another and back to God. But different people have identified different biggest problems facing humanity, and they have created different solutions to those different problems. And that is why there are so many different religions, because so many of us are trying to understand the world and come up with the correct answer to these problems. Another question people ask, how should Christians view other religions? My answer, we should view them as genuine attempts to seek an understanding of this world and the next, just like we are doing. Next question, how is God at work in other religions? Here, I will steal my answer from another one of my favorite books. Much like most of the books that I love, this one is a bit controversial. It's called The Shack by Reverend Paul Young. Say hi to Paul. Say hi to Paul. There we go. And I'm going to quote a little bit from The Shack here. Does that mean, asked Mac, that all roads lead to you? Not at all, smiled Jesus. Most roads don't lead anywhere. What it does mean is that I will travel any road to find you. End of the quote. Now, this is a simplified answer, which is great because simplicity is often concise, but is also not great because simplicity tends to lack nuance. So without doing a whole sermon within a sermon here, let me just say this. I don't believe that all paths lead to Jesus. I also don't believe that all paths lead to nowhere, but I do very much believe that God will find us on any path on which we are traveling. The last question that Adam identifies as one that many folks will ask about world religions in a study in a Christian church, right? This is the question that we have to get it out of the way before we can go any farther. And the question is, what is the fate of people who are not Christians, people who genuinely follow other faith traditions? For many Christians, the answer to this question is actually very simple. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. And if you don't go to heaven, then you go to hell. And therefore, if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. There is biblical justification for this belief. But I stand firmly in my belief that no human is ever going to be the one to answer this question. In the end, it is God's choice who goes where and to what places. And here's the thing, God is all about grace, right? God is constantly pouring out grace and love on us and calling us children of God. And I don't believe that when we die, suddenly we stop being God's children. I also don't believe that God would force anyone to be in a relationship. And therefore, there must be an alternative for folks who truly do not wish to be a part of God's kingdom. But what that looks like, I'm not sure about. I can't imagine that it is a place of eternal torment, though. So my answer to this question is another quote from another controversial book that I love that's called Love Wins. That's both the quote and the name of the book, so there we go. This book is by Rob Bell. Say hi to Rob. There he is with his very adorable dog. You can disagree with Rob and I, but I really hope you don't. Okay. Next thing to keep in mind, studying other faiths does not need to be either A, a source of a faith crisis or existential crisis, or B, thought of as only an evangelical opportunity. As I was preparing for this sermon, I had a great conversation with Jill Ann. There she is. She is also right there. Say hi to Jill Ann. She is actually in the room, so you really do have to say hi to her. Hi, Jill Ann. There we go. She said something very beautiful that I told her I was immediately going to steal and put in this sermon, so here it is, okay? 
Here's the example she gave me. Imagine that you and I have gone out to lunch together, and you ask me to tell the story of how I met my husband. There he is, say hi to Garth. I would tell you our love story. I'd tell you how I asked him on a date within like the first month of knowing him and he turned me down. And then four months before I was gonna graduate and three years after I met him, he had the audacity to ask me out to the same place that I had originally asked him to go to. And I would also tell you how grateful I am now that by saying no originally, he forced us into building a really solid friendship before we started dating. He's truly my best friend. I might tell you fun stories about our relationship, like how someone stole our wedding cake. That really is a funny story, and I would love to tell you about it sometime. And I can tell you difficult stories about how we've faced people's racism and bigotry. Those stories aren't so fun. All of this, the good and the bad, might help you understand why I love my husband so much. It might even make you want to reflect on your own relationships. You might even want to tell me about the relationships that you have. Or maybe it will inspire you to start a new relationship. Or maybe inspire you to improve the one that you have already. But you know what it's not going to do? This time of conversation between you and me about my love for my husband? It's not going to make you fall in love with my husband. Right? And that's not the goal in the first place. This is a great way for us to talk about interfaith conversations when we get to have them. Our goal is not, and should not be, to hear someone else's love story so that we can change them, but to hear it so that we can know what has edified somebody else in their faith, to learn their love story of their, of their faith. We might pick up some really good ideas from them and share ideas of our own, and we'll hopefully have a closer bond with this person that we have shared these things with but we're not going to lose our own faith in the conversation. And our goal in the conversation shouldn't be for them to lose theirs either. Hopefully, what's going to happen is both of us are going to walk away with stronger faith. The last point is one that I've already started to make. We are not many paths up one mountain. Humanity contains many mountains, and there are several paths up to their summits. I hope that you will take the time to engage with the study with us over the next few weeks and maybe even jump into one of the classes that we have running alongside this sermon series. In our classes, we'll be looking at Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Along the way, we'll be talking about the different mountains and different paths up to their heights. We'll talk about what we have in common with these faiths, and we'll talk about what is different. All along the way, we'll keep in mind that being different doesn't mean that we can't have unity. It means, in fact, that we can love each other and create unity without forcing uniformity. I'll leave you with this example. This is a picture of me. Say hi to me. Hi. And some of my fellow seminarians as we attended what was then called the 9-11 Unity Walk. It takes place on a Sunday in September and is, it was established in the aftermath of 9-11-2001 when there was a great deal of hatred towards people of other faiths, especially the Islamic and the Sikh communities. It takes place on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C., starting at a synagogue and ending at a statue of Mahatma Gandhi. Along the path, there are a lot of houses of worship, including the National Cathedral, a Greek Orthodox Church, a Russian Orthodox Church, a big evangelical non-denominational charismatic church, a Catholic church, a community that is a progressive offshoot of the Mormons, a Sikh temple, a Buddhist temple, the Islamic center, a Hindu temple, the Vatican embassy, and as I said, the whole thing kicks off at a synagogue or a Jewish house of worship. Each of these holy places would open their doors so that you could come in and see what worship would be like in that place. Some would host demonstrations, some would host projects like service projects, some would have music, others uh, would th have things like with the Buddhists, you could learn meditation, and um, if you went into the charismatic church, they would pray for you in their charismatic style. At the Vatican Embassy, the nuns there were serving the best lemonade I have ever had in my entire life. And at the Islamic Center, you could learn how to properly put on a hijab, and they were giving tours of their beautiful building. But the thing that I will never forget was walking into the Sikh temple. Not only 
were they teaching people how to tie their traditional turbans, but they also fed everyone. I'm not talking about a few people here. I mean every single person of the literally thousands of people who came to this walk were fed a full meal by the Sikhs. It was as close as I will ever come to witnessing the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? It was truly felt miraculous. The food just kept coming. They never ran out of food or the energy to make it, right? It was amazing. And they did all of this because of the deep love that they had for this interfaith community. And here's why this love is so important to them. You see, they almost lost their temple. It was almost taken from them because there was this terrible man who came into ownership of the property where their building sat, from which they were renting the space. And he raised the rent, like, astronomically high in an attempt to kick them out of the building because he thought they were Muslims. Now, instead of correcting him and thus allowing his hatred of the Muslim community to continue, they instead called upon their neighbors. On the list of things that this ignorant and hateful man didn't know was that because of the unity walk, all of these different religious communities were super well connected, and together they raised the money for the Sikhs to be able to keep their building. And feeding all of us on this walk was one of the ways that they were saying thank you to everyone for their help. Look what God can do when we come together without any agenda other than to love one another. God was at work there, and I know that God will be at work here as we go on this interfaith journey together over the next few weeks. Just before I close us in prayer, I would be remiss if I did not say that this entire conversation that we'll be having feels even more important right now in light of the hostage situation that took place yesterday at Beth Israel Synagogue in Cooleyville, Texas. As we move into our time of prayer, please hold in your hearts the four hostages, including Rabbi Charlie, for whom interfaith work is deeply important, and the hostage taker, who is the only one who did not survive this incident. Let us pray. God, grant us peace and reconciliation, but not before you grant us justice and difficult conversations. Show us the way back to you and to each other. On this weekend where we stop to remember the words, actions, and legacies of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I ask that you would help us to remember his words and his actions and help us to remember who taught him everything that he knew, and that's you. Help us to hold his words close to our hearts, not just the beautiful words, but the ones that we don't often quote, the ones that convict us, the ones that challenge us to join the movement for racial justice, economic justice, and the hard work of interfaith dialogue. We lift to you this day the people of Cooleyville, Texas. We lift to you our guests at Watts this week. We lift to you all of those who will be negatively impacted by the snow. And we continuously lift to you, God, the victims of COVID-19 and their loved ones, and all of our healthcare workers and essential services employees. And we lift all of these things to you in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing, sing, sing.
are so glad that you all are joining us here in worship today. Stay safe in this snow apocalypse that might be coming. Um, and we're so just thankful for your presence with us in worship. A couple things to know as we go forward. Um, there are classes that are going along reading the book that goes along with our sermon series. And if you would like to be in one, you have four opportunities to do that. Two of them are Sunday mornings. Those two happen to be during this service, so sorry about that. Um, one of them is with the Koinonia class, the other one is with our plus one class. But if you would like to continue worshiping at 10 o'clock and not go to those, but still want to be in a study, you have two other opportunities. One of them is Monday nights. That class is meeting on Zoom at 6.30, starting tomorrow. Yes, I know it's a holiday day, but we're doing it anyway. Um, so if you would like to join us, please do jump in. And especially on this first week, if you don't have a book yet, you will be fine. Um, I do suggest you, uh, pick one up. We have the first edition copy is still a few here at the church, or you can get online and get the second edition, which is better. And then um, we also have an in-person study option on Wednesday afternoons at 1 p.m., and we will be in room uh, 132, which is the multi-purpose room down at the end of the long hallway. So I hope that you all will come and join us for one of those studies. And hear now your benediction. Now go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. May those in this world to whom love is a stranger find in you most generous friends. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>